look over there. See, the line's not so long. You yeah. can go get in it. Now take Andy's hand and hold on to him, and we'll see you later, okay? Yeah, yeah, stay together. You don't, don't get lost. Okay. Oh, boy, Young man, hey kid, just where do you think you're going? Going up to see Sarah. <laughs> the line ends here. It begins there. The line waiting to see Santa Claus stretched all the way back to Terre Haute. And I was at the end of it. I like Santa. Yeah. Let's face it, most of us were scoffers. But moments before zero hour, it did not pay to take chances. <laughs> gone blank. Frantically, I tried to remember what it was I wanted. I was blowing it, blowing it. Come on, kid. How about a nice uh, football? 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 What's a football? <laughs> Without conscious will, my voice squeaked out. Football. Okay, get him out of here. A football? Oh, no. Okay, what was I doing? Wake up, is... stupid. Wake up. No. <laughs> kid. Merry Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. Well, good morning, Impact. I have a confession to make. That was my, as a kid, my all-time favorite Christmas movie. It was not a Christmas unless little Billy watched A Christmas Story. That made it complete. I love that movie. But before we get into the message today, I want to highlight some things 
2023 is going to be an amazing year here at Impact. I hope you are saddled up and buckled up and ready to roll because I believe God is going to do something significant next year. And I hope you make a commitment to be a part of what God's going to be doing here through all of us individually and collectively. One thing I want to, a couple things I want to highlight next year. First of all, February 24th, Rank Collective is going to be here on the stage uh, worshiping with us. And so I hope you make plans to be here. Rank Collective is an awesome band. Um, quite honestly, I'm surprised that, that they're going to, they're coming here. So that's, that's going to be pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. I'm just being honest with you guys right now. You know, that's awesome. And so tickets are on sale now in the cafe. So you can get them. Don't get up and walk out now, please. But after service, you can go straight to the cafe and get your tickets because they're going to be going on sale to the general public here very soon. So if you are wanting to be here, don't be on the outside looking, looking uh, missing out because I believe these are going to sell pretty fast. Also, guys, we are planning a men's breakfast in, G in January. Details are coming soon. If you're a baseball fan, you're going to want to be here for that men's breakfast, guys. I'm not going to tell you more. Watch for the details coming very soon. Um, it's going to be exciting things. God is on the move. But let's just pray as we prepare our hearts and our minds for today's message. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you so much for your goodness and for your love for us. Lord, whatever we brought into this place, whatever hurt, hang-ups or, or habits or attitudes, Lord, may we just lay them at your feet that right now we can experience you. Speak to us in a whole new way. And may you be glorified. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Like I mentioned a moment ago, A Christmas Story as a kid was my all-time favorite movie. It was the, the must-see. A Christmas Story, if you're not familiar with it, the original version. I did not see the, the new one yet. So if you watch it already, you're ahead of the game uh, from me. But the original was a timeless detail of a child's innocent view of Christmas. It was looked at through an adult lens as, a, as the boy was an older man at that time. It's calling out all the absurdities, all the craziness, remembering the things that define his memories, the experiences he had, and how he saw it. And it's all about the superficial importance of Christmas to a child. What they focus on, what we focus on as children. You know, Ralphie's hopes and dreams were centered around getting that Red Rider BB gun. Everything was caught up in that. You know, like Ralphie, I think we're not much different than he is. As children and sometimes as adults as well. We, we allow ourselves to get pulled into things that are of superficial importance. Things that may be good or maybe not, that pull us away from what is best. And we miss out on what matters most. And for all of us, we're in this constant wrestling match of what is a need and what is a want. And so often that, that through our lives, we wrestle with, just like Ralphie, we create things that quite honestly are wants, but we fabricate it superficially in our mind and redeveloped it and repackaged it into a need. And there's so many things in our lives that have become needs in our mindset that are really just wants. And many times we allow things that may be good or maybe not pull us away from what is best. And we miss the bigger picture. You know, one of the most, the most popular stories in the Bible of the Christmas time is the story of the wise men, the magi. You know, in their story, they were being pulled into one of the greatest stories ever known. But like us, in so many ways, the people in Jerusalem at that time were so busy and caught up in their day-to-days that they missed the novelty of the moment. They missed the reality of the manger, of the child. And here were these wise men, these astrologers, these guys who were constantly looking at the universe to see the story it was telling. Because the Bible tells us that all things that are created works together and highlights what we do not see, the mysteries and the wonders of God at work. And these guys who were not of Jewish descent were getting caught up in something big is happening. They were seeing the power of the moment when everybody surrounding them were quite honestly missing it. They were missing it. They were missing what was the most important thing for other things that they deemed were even more important. You know, the story starts like this in Matthew chapter 2. 
After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem was, was disturbed with him. You know, the Magi arrived in Jerusalem. Something big was happening. But there's something profound in that, those, those verses that we just read that I can't help but, but be stuck on it. It just kind of pulls me in because I think we all wrestle with it. Did you catch it? The Bible specifically said, King Herod was disturbed, and all the people were with him. That is such a profound statement. A statement I think we all get caught up into. You know, what we see happening here is the king's attitude had an enormous impact and effect on the people's attitude. The king's attitude completely transformed the attitude of an entire city, of entire countryside on that day. You know, attitudes is kind of like a whirlpool. Have you ever, as a kid, you got in a swimming pool with those above ground round poles and you're racing around with all your friends and you make the waters go faster and faster and faster and faster until you get the water current really going? You know, what whirlpools do, they create this current and inv inevitably everything that surrounds that whirlpool gets sucked in. It's impossible when the whirlpool go goes to not get sucked into the current. That's what the whirlpools do. They just suck everything in around it. It's a cycle that just pulls in all the surroundings. Something happens around us and we get caught in the whirlpools of life. Let's just be honest, guys. I'm, I'm speaking to myself just as much as I'm trying to share this with you. It is so easy, and we all get caught up into it by, the, by, the, by what we surround ourselves with, by the influences in our life, whether they're personally right in front of us or on all the social media stuff that we spend hours every day tuned into. It's these little whirlpools that just pull us in and pull us in and pull us in. And it affects our attitudes. You cannot sidestep this reality. Every one of us is hugely affected by what surrounds us. Hugely affected. What do we allow to surround us? What do we allow to influence us? Because we start these little whirlpools that just pulls everybody in and everything in around us. It's kind of like a forest fire. You know how like the majority of forest fires are started? By a little spark. Maybe someone flicked a cigarette butt over here or something else just kind of threw a spark over there. And this one little spark created this forest fire that destroyed the whole forest. It's all it took. And so many things in our lives are absolutely affected because of the spark of our attitude. And all that begins by the whirlpool we allow ourselves to get into. The attitude of the king affected the entire city. Everyone got pulled in. That's profound to me. Don't miss this, guys. Our attitudes has a big impact on the people we encounter. Your attitude has a significant impact on every person that you come into contact with. And it creates this domino effect. It's, it's this whirlpool that we all get caught up into. And, and let's not, let's not dilute, dilute this. Let's not sidestep this. We're all caught up in the whirlpool. We all get affected by it. You know, we all see it, don't we? I mean... One of my things I love is when I go into a drive through say, at Starbucks to order my $50 cup of coffee, you know, and I'm going through the line, and I'm thinking, man, I have to take out a loan for this cup of coffee. And then I get up there, and I'm getting ready to hand my little cool app that I give to them because it makes you feel like I'm not really spending any money, you know. And I set them, go, I stick my phone out the window only to hear, hey, it's covered. The person in front of you paid for you. And you're thinking, oh, the kids can go to college, right? But you think, boy, that was so generous. I love that. Thank you so much. And so what do you instantly do? Pay for the person behind me. 
And it begins this domino effect, doesn't it? It's this domino effect that just goes on and goes on and goes on. That someone impacted your attitude that you turned around and said, here, I want to share it. And the same is true in the opposite way. It's absolutely true in the opposite way. I mean, how many times in our life when life just does not go as planned? When things just happen, when that spark happens and we get sucked into this whirlpool, it just goes. You know, the influence is all around us. And we're like, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds right. That sounds cool. Or that ticks me off. And it just goes. And then before you know it, you walk into that same store, that same person behind the counter. And they didn't really do anything wrong. But something just kind of annoys you and you give them an attitude. And that same person who life was pretty good at that moment, now you impacted them. And then when you walk out the store, what you don't see is then how that person's attitude completely changed because the whirlpool you sucked them into. And now they begin to how they treat every other person. All because of the attitude you walked in with. Our attitudes have a significant effect on every person around us. You create domino effects all over the place. So do I all because of my attitude. And that's how the devil works. That's exactly how the devil works. The devil's job, his goal, I will say, is to create these little whirlpools of attitudes that we all get caught up into. And someone's attitude is bringing me in, somebody else's attitude is bringing you in. And we kind of get pulled into these attitudes away from what is best away from God working in our lives and around us, away from how God wants to use us to, to bring his love, his joy, his peace, his goodness into somebody else's life. He creates these whirlpools to pull us away from what is best. And then before you know it, he creates these whirlpools that, that's a domino effect that pulls everybody away from him, from what is best. The devil is constantly working behind the scenes to create something different in us. It's kind of like the stink bug that just showed up. Let me take care of that. I just messed up his day. Sorry about that. But we all have this in our lives, don't we? I mean, that's how the devil works. He creates whirlpools, and that's what he did in this story. Don't, don't miss the profound moment in this story. The, king's, the king was disturbed, and all the people with him. Holy cow, guys. We see this all throughout the Bible. We see this all throughout history. And we see it in our lives today. Let's just be honest. I I'm talking to myself just as much as you. I see it every day in my life with these little whirlpools that happened all around me that pull me in, that begin to affect my attitude. And this person who had, whose attitude was junky now has affected my attitude who's junky, and I just pass it on. When God's whole plan is to to create within us a desire and a passion and a purpose that draws people into his presence. But because we allow ourselves to get sucked into all these attitudes and these whirlpools, it pulls us away from what matters most. And just like the people on that day in Jerusalem, we're really no different. We're really no different. In this story, the evil forces were personified by this political leader. They all took on his attitude and his agenda and his focus. And they all got sucked into what he was going after. And they missed what was best. They missed what was best. Here we see this, this, this kind of avalanche starting. This group of people, this city of people who were set against God's chosen one because they were focusing on their own agendas instead of him. It's natural for all of us within our own hearts to become so self-absorbed. Guys, can I just be real? Because I'm speaking to myself too, so don't, don't be throwing rocks at me or coal, right? But we live in a world that is so me-focused, so self-absorbed, and guess what? I'm guilty too. I'm guilty too. I get so self-absorbed, so self-centered, so me-focused, and guess what that does? It affects my attitude. 
And then when these whirlpools start, because they always do almost every single day, these whirlpools that start, they so easily just pull you in. And they pull me in too. And then before you know it, your focus, your agenda, and your attitude is completely opposite of what God is trying to do in you and through you. And you're missing what's best. You're missing it. I can't help but see all these people who missed it on this day. You know, and how our attitude affects that. Affects those around us. And don't miss this as well. Our attitudes are significantly impacted with who we are surrounded by. You are completely affected by your surroundings. I know I hear a lot where, where we tend to say, hey, I'm strong enough. I can handle it. I can make my own decisions. No one really affects me. Guys, we're fooling ourselves. We're lying to ourselves. Everyone, every one of us, myself included, is hugely, hugely, hugely affected by the surround, our surroundings. And oftentimes, because I get so self-focused and self-absorbed, and I get the me first mentality going on, because I do, just ask my wife, then what I tend to do is the influence I surround myself with, I try to align those that support what I'm, go, what I'm trying to go after. And before you know it, we align things to enforce, this is the agenda I want in my life. This is where I'm going after. And before you know it, we're in this whirlpool. Our surroundings affect our heart, our focus, and our attitude. Whether it's the people we surround ourselves with or all the hours we spend on social media. It affects us significantly. You know, for King Herod, going, looking at him, he was the de facto king of Israel at this time. Okay? And he lived and he rolled in paranoia. You have probably have read the history books. You've seen leaders like that who live in paranoia. They're constantly looking over their shoulders in complete fear of someone kind of taking control. They were so power hungry that that's what all their focus was. And that was King Herod to a T. He was so power hungry. All he cared about was being in control. All he cared about with the power he received as king. And so he did everything he could to protect that. And he lived and led in paranoia, constantly worried about who's going to try to run me out. And you see that paranoia play out in the people and the effects that he had in the way that he led. The king was disturbed. And all the people were disturbed with him. He affected the attitude of the whole nation because his attitude spiraled out of control and just took them all down the road with him. We see this all throughout the Bible and all throughout history. How people just come into an uproar because their focus gets misaligned of what God's trying to do. In, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, we see Paul deal with it. He, Paul, the Apostle Paul, as you read the, God, the, the Acts, he went from city to city into all the Gentile nations to advance the kingdom of God, to plant new churches that help everybody in all the new cities, to see Jesus for who he was as the Savior of the world, to see who they were in him and give their lives over to him. And he planted churches all throughout the regions. And at this one particular time in Acts, he was in the city called Ephesus. Ephesus was a Greek city. And they had many different gods that they worshipped to at that time. And at this particular time, there was one by the name of Artemis. And everybody worshipped him. And Paul went into the city and he preached the gospel, preached Jesus. And all of a sudden got word to this blacksmith. The blacksmith in the heart of the city. He, his job was he, he developed all these shrines and, and idols and, and statues in honor of Artemis. In case you didn't catch that. He used that for his own personal gain. That was his business. And so when Paul was coming in and preaching Jesus and Christ crucified, and he is the one true God, and it got word to this blacksmith, he started to realize, Paul's messing with my business. I can't let that happen. You see, friends, don't, don't miss this. The world has always been and continues to be focused on and ran by greed and hatred. And we all get caught up in that whirlpool. Greed and hatred. Greed and hatred. And that's what we see develop in Ephesus. This blacksmith was ticked 
off. Paul was causing me to lose business. And so what did this blacksmith do? Well, he began to go out in the, in, on the streets and kind of raise this little uproar. He was creating his own little whirlpools against Paul, against the message of Christ, because this guy was messing with my business. And it got so big, it got so out of control, the Bible says that a riot began to happen in the city of Ephesus. And Paul's life was in danger. It got out of control by this man's whirlpool. The attitude of some completely changed the attitude of the majority. And that's the story of this world. That's the reality of our whirlpools. When the attitude of some completely transforms the attitude of many. And as things in Ephesus got out of control, the Bible says in verse 32 of Acts 19, the assembly was in confusion. The riot was going. The riot had gone out of control. Some were shouting one thing, some another. And then it says most of the people did not even know why they were there. The whirlpool consumed them. And most of the people were just going with it. I mean, that's what we tend to do. When the whirlpool happens and starts to suck us in and, and pull us in, we kind of start to lose control of our own thinking, of what is right and wrong, what is best. I mean, that seems right, that looks good, or, or, or how about this? Everybody's doing it, let's just go with it. Let's go with the crowd. And that's exactly what happened in Ephesus. And we see it happening all the time in our lives and our world. People getting pulled into the whirlpool of some that affects the majority of all those around us. And before you know it, you get pulled away from what is best. Of what God is trying to do. It's the whirlpool of life. When our attitude gets the best of us, sometimes we don't even think straight anymore. We just go and then think later. Have you been there? I know I have. And I find it very interesting, going back to the story of, of Jesus' birth, very interesting that the religious leaders, you know, completely missed it. They completely missed it. The influence of what surrounded them completely intensified and overwhelmed them. Guys, don't miss this truth. If you catch one thing here today, hear this. Who we surround ourselves with matters. It matters. What influences you are allowing into your life matters. It may not seem like a big deal, but it's a significant deal on the trajectory of your life. Significant. And the influence of our surroundings is so intense. It created this riot in Ephesus. It created the people in Jerusalem to completely miss Jesus being born, even though all the signs pointed that they knew. They missed it because of the, because of the influences they allowed around them. You know, don't overlook the attitude that we have and how our attitude affects our focus and our agendas and our, and our lives. Paul even wrote, bad company corrupts good morals. Who we surround ourselves with matters. Herod was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem was with him. He completely transformed an entire city's focus because of his attitude. And Herod knew something was up. In verse 4, it says, When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. He went to the religious leaders to try to fact check everything. Hey, is this right? I, I mean, what's being said here? Because I, I got word that, that there's this child that was born that, that could be a king. Like, like, what's going on here? And the religious leaders all pointed and said, yes, this is what the prophecy said. There will be the star. It will be in Jerusalem. And, and everything is lining up. So, yeah, it confirms what's going on here. And I find it very interesting, very interesting, that the religious leaders who confirmed to King Herod all the signs are lining up. Not one of them do we have an account jumping up and saying, we need to get to Bethlehem now. Not one seemed to care. Not one seemed to move. I don't know why there was no interest. 
I don't know why these people who studied this and waited for this their whole lives, and now all the signs pointed to it, and they didn't do nothing. I don't get it. I don't. I don't know if they were downplaying the Messiah. I don't know if they had too much on their schedule. It's like, we're just too busy. It's not the right time. We'll go next week. You know, I got stuff to do today. I don't think if, if, if they, I don't know if they just didn't think it was that important. I, I don't know if their attitude was that bad that they were so focused on something different rather than the Messiah. I don't know if the political influence of King Herod had that significant effect. I was like, you know what? We're staying here. I don't know. I don't know. All I know is this one thing. They saw the signs. They knew the signs. But they stayed. They stayed. Something happened that created a barrier in their life from things that they were more focused on, things that they deemed as good, and they were missing what was best. They missed it. What's that for you? What barriers have you developed in your life that causes you to miss the best thing? We all have that. We all have that. Barriers that causes us to miss Jesus. You know, when I was a kid in in elementary, my favorite game to play was called Jump the Brook. I've asked several people this morning if they've ever heard the game, and everybody looks at me like I have three eyes. So I, maybe it was my, only my school that, that knew how, that, that played this game. Because my, my, I went to some of the best school in the world, so, no, I mean, no diss on you guys. But we play this game called Jump the Brook. I have Genesis Straley is somewhere here. She's going to come out and help me with that. There, let's give Jenna a good hand of, good round of applause. So this game's pretty simple, and I hope, Jen, that, you know, you show us a little bit better abilities than the abilities that your dad tends to have, okay? Because we know you're, I've seen your dad play, like, basketball and stuff. It's not pretty. All right. So here's how the game played. So we would set up little, like, ropes or something along the floor, and everybody would get in the line. This is when all the young boys start pushing each other and egging each other on and saying, I can jump further than you. It's like a long jump game, right? So we would just simply jump the brook, right? But then as we jumped the brook... Every round got bigger. And so we would move this further out to try to, to jump the brook. Do you have that ability, Jen? Come on, make your family proud. There we go. All right. And then, so they would jump the brook there. Yeah. Is that, I, think, I think we're going to call Ringling Brothers and get her hooked up for, the, for a show. But as the game on, she, she's running away because she knows how big this gets. Okay, you can go. But as this went on, we would just completely, cont- continually jump the brook. And make it further. And every round it got further and further and further. Before you know it, we would have to be lining up like, run like 20 yards to get enough speed to jump in. We're like wiping out and doing crazy things just to get across this brook. It got so wide until the last person was standing. In a spiritual sense, I think this is kind of like how we live our lives. You know, we start with things that seem good or kind of take our focus away. They, they don't seem like that big of a deal, right? I can still get over here to Jesus. I can still get over there. I mean, it's not that big of a leap or a jump. It's, I, I can do this. I can handle this. But as this develops and as we don't deal with it and as we allow ourselves to get caught up in those whirlpools of life, whatever it may be, it just gets bigger. I can still jump it. But see, every time, every day, every, every week, every month, every year, every situation, every attitude, outburst, whatever it may be, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then before you know it, that brook is so large, I can't jump it anymore. I just can't get from side to side. The gap is just too big just so big I can't do it and I fear how many of our lives are being lived in that way you know we've allowed barriers to be developed in our life that have just slowly grown and grown and grown that now our lives are so out of control that we struggle just making it through each day we struggle with just experiencing the presence of God in our life 
what is that barrier that you've allowed the devil to open in your life? And I say, that, I say aloud, please hear me on that, because I know some barriers we create because of our own choices. And let's just be honest, some whirlpools in our life just happen. You don't have any say or control over it just happening, but it does. And the unfortunate reality of life, sometimes things happen that you didn't create, but now you have to deal with. That's life. And so in those moments, when life hits you in that way, you know, I say develop because we still have an opportunity of what are you going to do with it. How are you going to deal with this? And oftentimes we don't deal with it well, or we just kind of excuse it or ignore it and push it away, and all that does is create a bigger and bigger gap and barrier. And before you know it, life is out of control. Life is out of control. You know, going back to the story, in the peop- for the people in Jerusalem, for whatever reason, these barriers were just growing and growing and growing and growing to the point to where the child has come. And not only did they miss it, they had no desire to even get there. No desire. Just let me go back to my life. You know, and so... King Herod called together the religious leaders to find out, is this true? And then after he did that, in verses 7 through 8, it says, Then King Herod called the Magi, the wise men, secretly, and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child as soon as you find him. Report to me so that I may too go and worship him. Do you see what Herod did? This crafty, paranoia man and leader that he was. He tried to win their favor by by disguising his true intent. He was trying to build a relationship with them so that he could get something from them. He didn't care about them. He didn't care about being buddies' buddies with them. He didn't care about going and worshiping the king. All he cared about was, I want to develop this relationship so that you can do something for me. And he deceived them into that. Guys, I'm, I'm crazy terrified. Because what I see across our world right now is, as a whole, our relationships are at a serious, serious crisis point. Relationally, we are at a serious crisis point. Trust in relationships has been completely fractured because we have a tendency to be me-focused or me-first in our mentality, in our thinking. And we become so self-absorbed. We have so many selfish ambitions. I'm not trying to throw darts. I'm telling you, I'm speaking to myself too. Because I struggle with this just along with you guys. This is human nature stuff. It's the whirlpools we all get sucked into. And because we get so focused on that, our own, on our own agendas, what we want, what we're trying to chase, that we miss the best in our relationships because our focus has shifted away from what is best to what seems good, what feels right, what makes me happy. Just like Herod was doing. We will focus more on what will this relationship give to me and what is the best in this relationship. And I fear how many of you right now in this moment struggle just to get through every single day because of how fractured the relationships are in your life, how broken they are. You struggle because you don't know who you can trust because so many of your relationships have caused you, any, led you down a path of anything but the ability to trust. You're so broken and hurting. You struggle from, ex- from experiencing God's best in your life because you're not, we're not cultivating healthy relationships. We surround ourselves with people who are more focused on their agendas and what they want than what's best for us. And in some ways, we do the same in return to others. And because of the lack of healthy relationships, so many of us struggle with just being seen and valued and loved. We walk around feeling completely empty and worthless and broken, wondering if anybody even cares anymore. 
Well, can I just tell you, there is a God who loves you. There is a God who's fighting for you every day, who was born into this world in that, in that manger to ultimately die for you. And every day, that same living God is fighting for you, that you may experience his, his best in your life, his love, his joy, his peace, and his goodness, that you will be seen and valued and loved as the child that you are, and that you will run towards him, that you'll see fulfill those needs through him. Because what happens, guys, listen to me, guys, and we all do this because our trust has been fractured, because the relationships, and we're not cultivating healthy relationships, and we all have that desperate need to be seen, to be valued and loved, we begin to seek attention in some way. And too many of us are trying to find attention in other relationships in all the wrong ways. Because somewhere we made ourselves believe, well, even if it's negative attention, it's still attention. And that's not healthy. That's not healthy. My friends, stop trying to find the approval of those around you and search God. Run towards him. He sees you. He values you. You are loved by the creator of all things. Run towards his presence. But we can find ourselves so broken and confused and beat up in this society and in our lives. And all of our attitudes are affected. And we all get sucked into the same old whirlpool of life. That pulls us in. And then before you know it, we're pulling everybody else in as well. And Herod tried to build a relationship with the wise men to get what he wanted. To stay in power. And we have the same tendency to act out. How do you act out to get the attention that you crave? I hope you know when you, I hope when you walked into this place that you felt seen and valued and loved because you are. And if you're struggling with that feeling right now, I hope you stop by the Engage Impact after the service. Or if you're online, reach out to the host right now because we want to walk with you. We want you to know that you are not alone. We are here with you. And we want to love you and pray with you and walk with you. you know, because, you know, we struggle with so many unhealthy relationships, we struggle to identify what is a healthy relationship anymore. And just really quickly, unhealthy relationships are things that, that are focused on themselves, their own agendas. Unhealthy relationships push us towards our own hearts, our own feelings, our own, our own agendas. That's not healthy. Biblical healthy relationships are relationships that are constantly pointing us towards the presence of God and helping us find our way in Him. My friends, we need to cultivate relationships that guide us to His presence to experience him more. That's why here at Impact, we value growth groups. Growth groups are so important. If you're not in a group, you need to get into a group because it's in that group where you can cultivate those healthy uh, relationships. You know, a, a great group that we're starting in January, if you haven't been through one of our Next Steps groups called Rooted, you need to join that right now. It, it's a great opportunity to journey towards the presence of God with other people to experience healthy relationships in your life and to experience the presence of God. If you have not been in that group and, and you want to experience that amazing journey in your life, just on your Connect card, write Rooted, or if you're online, you know, just let the host wrote, know right now. We would love to get you connected with that, but we need other people. You know, after the wise men had this, had the secret meeting with, with the Herod, the Bible says that they went on their way, and the star had, they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with their gifts of gold, frankincense, and, mo and, and myrrh. When the Magi found the child, they were overjoyed, the Bible says. It, it's fascinating to me that these Gentiles who had nothing to do with caring about this coming child were the ones who raced to him and were overjoyed and all the religious people who knew what was coming, who saw all the signs, had no interest whatsoever. And sometimes I wonder, 
I feel that we tend to develop expectations of what we think God should be doing in our lives, of how he should be operating, of how he should be coming to us. That in many ways we've lost the anticipation of him. In this story, it appears the religious leaders and all the religious folk lost the anticipation that the Messiah was coming. You know, the Bible says he's coming back. And in some ways, I fear that we have lost the, antici the anticipation of his return. The anticipation of the coming Messiah. The Magi were excited. They came to the house where Mary and the child were. And please note, I know our nativity scenes always has them right there when he was born, but that is not reality. You know, when the Magi came, it was months after the baby was born. The Bible says that they came to the house where they were at. They were already in, at home living and dwelling, and she was taking care of the baby when they got there. And they saw something about this baby. They bowed and worshiped him. Something was different. They gave him these gifts of gold, the status, a gift of a king. They gave him frankincense, the gift, the sign of divinity. And they gave him myrrh, the gift and the sign of a sacrificial death. They saw something in this baby. Something big was about to happen. And then in verse 12, having been warned of a dream, the Magi did not go back to Herod. They returned to their country by another route. At this moment, this was the moment that they realized Herod was deceiving them. This was the moment they realized Herod did not have our best interest in heart. This is the moment when they realized whatever Herod might be giving them to go and do this task, it may be good. Maybe it seemed like this could transform our lives. I mean, we can live well. I don't know what he was offering them. But this is the moment they realize, no, it's, I don't care what he's giving us. I just saw what was best. I just saw the child. I saw the baby. You know, in the movie, A Christmas Story, Ralphie convinced himself that he would not be happy. He convinced himself that Christmas would not be fulfilled. It would not be a good Christmas until he got the gift, the Red Rider be begun. And if he did not get that gift, he would not be happy. He would not have been satisfied. So often, I think, friends, we miss what is best for what seems good in the moment. The wise men were challenged with that, with whatever King Herod was offering them, to miss what was best for what appeared to be good in the moment. Ralphie missed that. He was focused on what seemed to be good in the moment. He missed what was best. And there's so many times in our lives that I think we convince ourselves, I need this, whatever that this is. And I won't be satisfied or happy until I get this. And I can't live without it. And we convince ourselves in such a way that we miss what is best. And we get caught up in these whirlpools. It's time to break free from the whirlpools, friends. What are those barriers we developed in our lives? What have we, how have we convinced ourselves of things that we think we need as pulling us away from the presence of God? Let's run towards him. Will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you because of your goodness and your love. Lord, in this moment, may we just run towards you. Help us to see you and to experience you, Father, fully. Lord, right now, in so many ways, you know, I just confess for myself and may we all confess together there are things in our lives that we've convinced ourselves that we need that pull us away from you. Lord, we've been so many, in so many ways, in different ways, we've been caught up in whirlpools that transform our attitudes and then in turn we create other whirlpools for other people to be affected by. But Lord God, may we create environments all around us that draw people towards you. Help us to experience you in a whole new way. It's in your name we pray. Amen.